uh, let's say you have a person and a car with a noise maker on top, a siren, let's say. And let's say that in this case, they are both in motion. Let's say the car is moving to the right at some unknown speed. And let's say you, the listener, are walking also to the right at a known speed. Let's say the person is three meters per second. And what else? And let's say we know the, the siren is creating a sound with a known frequency. Let's say 400 hertz is the sound that it should be producing, but you hear a different sound. Let's say you hear, first of all, just based on the situation so far, would you expect the sound you hear to be higher or lower pitch than this? And why would we expect that to be lower? Is it because as the car is moving farther, the, uh, the, the distance between the crests decreases, or the, sorry, the frequency decreases? Um, because the car is moving away, right? Right. If the car moves away, you get like a, a wavelength, you get a, a wave spreading out that was spreading out from this location. So a wave, the car was here, it emits a crest, that crest has spread out. Then the car moves and emits another crest a crest that has spread out some distance from that location. And then the car moves and you get a crest that's spreading out from that location and so on. So in the direction in front of the car, the waves get bunched closer and closer <laughs> together. Those waves getting bunched up closer together means shorter wavelength, higher frequency. On the other side, behind the car, the waves are getting more spread out because the car is traveling away from it, the waves it has previously emitted. So that's a longer wavelength and therefore a smaller frequency, slower frequency. So the fact that the car is moving suggests that we'd expect a lower frequency. On the other hand, you're also walking towards the car. What would that do to the frequency? Increase it. Yeah, if you're walking towards the source, if the, you as the listener are walking towards the source, these waves are going towards your location. You, if you're just standing still, you'd be hit by a certain number of wave fronts per second. But if you're walking into those waves, if you're walking towards the source, you're gonna be hit by more of those wave fronts per second. So the fact that the car is moving away from, the, away from you, the source is moving away from the listener, that would suggest a lower frequency. But the fact that you, the listener, are moving towards the source would suggest a higher frequency. So those are gonna be partially counteracting each other in terms of the effects. Um, and somebody mentioned lower because the car is moving faster. Yeah, if the car is moving faster than the person and that, that is presumably gonna win out in the end. So let's say that we do hear a lower frequency overall. Let's say 398 Hertz is the sound that is actually heard. We should be able to use this to solve for this one last unknown, the unknown speed of the car. So let's see if we can figure that out. Let's see if we can figure out how fast is the car going based on the frequency we know it's producing. Maybe this is a standardized siren that produces a constant 400 hertz sound and the sound we hear, 398 hertz. Maybe you've got an, elect an electric tuner and you can tell exactly what sound is being heard. So oh, may I ask a question yeah, um, about the circle diagram that you drew? Mm -hmm. As the car is moving forward and the wave or the crests are getting closer and closer, is it getting like is the wavelength uh, continuously getting smaller and smaller, or is it going to be a fixed 
Um, I don't know if that made sense, but like, is it continuously getting passes? smaller and smaller? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it should be constant. The the wave constant, okay. the effective wavelength at a certain location in front of the car shouldn't change as time passes. It depends only on the speed of the car. So it would. So as long as the speed of the car is constant. Slower. Okay. But yeah, if they, thank if, you so much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. If we assume the car is traveling at constant speed, then the, the perceived wavelengths should be constant as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So if we set up the, what's our usual equation for situations like this? If we want to compare the frequency that's observed versus the frequency that's created by the source. Is it like the frequency of the observer equals the velocity plus or minus velocity of observer over velocity plus or minus velocity of the source times the frequency of the source? Yeah. So that's the frequency produced by the source multiplied by this modifier turns into the frequency that's actually heard by the observer. So if we start filling these in, we know the frequency heard by the observer in this case. That's a given information. We know the frequency that's being produced by the source. And we know the observer, that's the person's speed here, three meters per second. So V source is the unknown we're trying to find. <clears throat> and also these, this V here represents what speed? The wave? Yeah, the speed of the wave itself. So in this case, speed of sound in air. And let's just say, let's say we know that to be, let's say 340 meters per second. So that's, that would presumably be given as well. Uh, also, we're gonna need to make some decisions about the plus and minus here. How would we make that decision? We were talking earlier about uh, how we knew whether or wh whether we should expect the result to be higher or lower pitch, right? The car is moving, uh, the source is moving away from the listener. Would that alone suggest a higher or lower frequency? Higher? If the car is moving away from the listener? Oh, lower, sorry. Yeah, that should be a, a longer wavelength because the waves are getting stretched out and therefore a lower frequency. So looking at just the source's motion, V source, we should expect V source to lead to a smaller frequency. And V source is in the denominator. For the denominator, would a larger or smaller denominator lead to a smaller result? Larger? Yeah, a larger denominator leads to a smaller result. Larger denominator. leads to a smaller result. And we want a smaller result. The, the fact that the car is moving away should suggest a lower frequency as a result. So to get, so we should want a larger denominator. To get a larger denominator, would you use plus or minus here? Yeah, plus should do it. So we're going to use plus here so that V source makes the denominator larger than it would be if the source wasn't moving. Because a larger denominator leads to a smaller frequency, which is what we should expect if the source is moving in this direction. As for the listener, uh, for plus or minus here, the, the listener is moving towards the source. Would you expect that to lead to a higher or lower frequency? Higher. Yeah, moving towards the source means you're being hit by more crests per second, more wave fronts per second. So we should expect that more speed for the listener should lead to a higher frequency. Since the observer speed is in the numerator, we want a higher numerator to lead to a higher frequency. So for the numerator to be larger, would you use plus or minus? Plus. 
Yeah, that's going to be plus also. So that larger value will lead to a larger result. So these should both be plus. And that's usually how I think through these things. I can never, I mean, there's some rules for this. I think the, I think the general rule is the direction from listener towards the source counts as positive for both of these. I mean, that seems to be what matches here. This direction from listener towards source is positive for both of these. Uh, it depends on, I, I usually think through it in like what we just did here. Uh, I think the general rule is the direction from listener towards source is the positive direction, at least in terms of what it worked out to here. I think that is generic there. But I think that I, I always have difficulty remembering rules like this. I can't remember, is it from the listener to source or source to listener or does it change? So what I usually do is just think through it conceptually like we just talked through there. Think of it as, Okay, so I know the listener is moving in a direction that I should expect to increase the frequency. If I want this to increase, should I use plus or minus here? I know the car is moving in a direction I expect to decrease the frequency. Should I use plus or minus here if I want this to decrease? So I would highly recommend thinking through it in those terms. Ask yourself, what do I have to modify in this, in this part of the function in order to make the result increase or in order to make the result decrease? So build the formula with that in mind. Any other questions on that so far? And of this entire formula, what's the one unknown that we're trying to actually solve for here? V source. Yeah, we're missing V source. We don't know how fast the car is moving. So let's try solving for that algebraically in terms of the variables and then plug in the numbers at the end. See what we can do with that. So how do we start isolating V source if that's what we're trying to find here? Looks like our first difficulty is that the variable we want is in the denominator of a fraction. How could we get that out of the fraction? We can multiply both sides by V plus V fourth. Yeah, if we multiply both sides by that entire denominator, then we get V plus V source times frequency of the observe, heard by the observer equals V plus V observer times frequency created by the source, which is a nice sort of symmetry there. V plus speed of sound plus one of the speeds times the other frequency, speed plus one of the speeds times the other frequency. And then what else to get V source isolated here? Divide by the frequency of observer. Yeah, divide both sides by observer frequency. And note that now we just got this ratio of frequencies times a speed. And one last step. Right, subtract V. So V source is just going to be this whole thing minus speed of sound. So let's try that out. If we fill in these values, we've got three forty meters per second plus speed of the observer, three meters per second, times the ratio of frequencies, source over observer, source over observer, so that'd be four hundred over three ninety eight. And this is Hertz divided by Hertz. So the units are gonna cancel out there. Minus V, so that's minus 340 meters per second. And at this point, we'd actually run the numbers. 343 times this ratio, 400 over 398. 
340 plus an extra three times 400 over 398 minus 340 would be about 4.7 meters per second. So that's how fast the car would have to be moving to make this happen exactly as shown. Any questions on that? Or any other questions on the Doppler effect so far? Another interesting example of the Doppler effect is uh, if the if the source emits a sound which hits the the observer and bounces off. If you've got an echo, and then returns to the original source as well, and you see this in uh, uh, speed guns, like if you've got a, a the, the radar guns for trying to figure out the, how fast the passing car is going. That's using radar, uh, radio waves, light rather than sound, but the principle is very similar. And also echolocation in animals like bats and I think dolphins as well. If you have, for instance, a bat, that's uh, trying to find the location of a moth. The bat is gonna emit a high-pitched sound. And let's say the bat is staying still for now. And let's say the moth is moving, let's say the moth is moving away from the bat at some unknown speed. And so the bat emits a sound. Let's call this F1. Bat emits a sound at frequency F1 and the moth is going to receive that sound. And what's going to happen to the frequency of that sound? How what would you expect the moth to perceive a higher or lower or same frequency? Lower because it's moving away? Yeah, if the moth is moving away, then the moth is going to be outrunning or not fully outrunning, but uh, trying to outrun these sound waves. And so that's going to be hit by fewer waves per second. So moth hears a new frequency F2, which is less than F1. And we could even write out what that frequency is going to be in terms of Doppler effect equation again. For a frequency of the listener, observer, same equation equals frequency created by the source times speed plus or minus, was it observer or source in the numerator? Observer. So the speed of the observer divided by V plus or minus speed of the source. So in this case, is the source the bat or the moth? The bat. Yeah, the bat is the source and the moth is the observer. Even if the moth can't actually hear this note, maybe this note is beyond the hearing range of moths, uh, but we still treat the moth as the observer because that's where the sound is going towards. So in this case, V source is zero. The bat is not moving. So that makes the numerator easier to deal with anyway. And for the moth, since the moth is moving away, should we treat that as, uh, we know that's gonna make the result smaller. May as well fill in 
source is F1, observer is gonna be F2. Should we expect, we, we wanna expect F2 to be less than F1. So should we be using plus or minus in the numerator? The minus sign? Yeah, if F2, if the result has to be smaller, that means we want a smaller numerator. So we should be using a subtraction here. And then V plus or minus zero is still just V. So that covers the outbound journey. The thing is, though, you can't really use this to solve for V observer. Let me label this V sub M, speed of the moth. So even if the bat has a little miniature calculator in its talons, you can't really solve this equation because the bat doesn't know how fast the moth is moving, and the bat doesn't know what frequency the moth hears. But the sound doesn't just stop here. When sound hits an object, what happens to the sound? It gets reflected. Yeah, some of that sound gets reflected. You get an echo. And of course, this is most, most noticeable if you shout at a large, solid, large flat solid object like a wall. You shout at a wall, you get an echo, which is some of that sound energy reflected back at you. But even if it's just a small soft object, it still reflects some of the sound, just not very much. But bats have, or bats are creating a very high pitched noise that is specifically intended to be able to bounce off of even small objects in a way that their ears can notice because they've got ears that are especially evolved for hearing very faint noises like this. So that means that after the sound hits the moth, some of it bounces off and now we're going to reverse this. We're going to have the sound of bouncing off of the moth. The reflected sound. The echo reflects from the moth. And what should we assume about the frequency of the echo? Should it be the same? Yeah should be that same F2. So the echo is gonna reflect off of the moth at frequency F2. Whatever frequency hits the moth, that same frequency reflects back off of the moth. Because remember, frequency is just number of cycles per second. If you've got, let's say 500 cycles hitting the moth per second, then 500 cycles will bounce off of the moth per second. So the reflected sound is gonna have the same frequency as the incoming sound. Out of curiosity, what changes then when, when something's reflected back? Is it just the amplitude changes or? Uh, yeah, amplitude can change because not all of the energy gets reflected. Some of it gets absorbed. So the amplitude is going to get weaker. Uh, the phase sometimes reverses, depending okay. on how the reflection happens. Uh, generally, depending on if you're reflecting, if you're reflecting off of a slower material or reflecting off of a faster material, Sometimes that mm -hmm. can leave the phase shift exactly as it is. Sometimes it can change the phase shift by an extra plus pi. Okay, so, so the main thing is just to know that frequency doesn't change. Right. Uh, okay. Thank and you. The, the phase shift changing can sometimes matter if you're looking at interference, especially if you're looking at what's called thin film interference. Like if you've got a, let's say you've got a body of water with a thin film of oil floating on top and you've got light coming in and some of the light bounces off the top of the oil. Some of the light goes through the oil and bounces off the top of the water. In that case, that's different kinds of reflection. So you get different amounts of phase shift. I don't okay. think we're gonna get into that in too much detail in 7C, but if it shows up, that's the idea we're talking about, that the reflection can cause a phase shift difference. Thank you. So this echo bounces off of the moth and the result is heard by the bat. Bat hears echo at some new frequency, let's say F3. So the bat is gonna hear a third different frequency and that the bat is gonna know. So as the bat, you emit some high pitched frequency and you hear back a sound that's a different frequency. And since the moth is moving away from you, would you expect a higher pitch or lower pitch? If we're treating the moth as the source this time. Mm 
yeah, should be lower. If, the, if we're treating the moth as the source of these echoed waves, the moth moving away from you means you're gonna hear a lower pitch because there are gonna be fewer wavelengths hitting you per second. The waves get more spread out in space. So F3 is gonna be lower than F2, which itself was lower than F1. So what's going on here is as the bat, you send out this sound at a certain frequency, a certain pitch, you hear back a lower note. The fact that you hear back a sound at all means that it has bounced off of some object. The fact that the sound you hear back is lower than the sound you sent out tells you that the object is moving away from you. And of course, the bat is not actually doing these calculations on a tiny calculator in its talons. This is in the combination of instinct and learned experience over time. But you can model what's going on here with these Doppler shift equations. In fact, we could set up a second equation covering the return of the sound. So that if we write out the same equation, F observed equals F source times V plus or minus V observer over V plus or minus V source. <clears throat> In this case, the observer is the bat who is traveling at speed zero. The source is now the moth traveling at speed V sub M. And again, we're expecting the moths traveling away to be making the results smaller. So should we use plus or minus in the denominator to make the results smaller? Uh, yeah, plus in the denominator is gonna make the results smaller. And then the source is the moth creating frequency F2. The observer is the bat hearing frequency F3. So this would be the equation governing the return of the sound, the echoed sound from the moth back to the bat. And V plus or minus V zero, or V plus or minus zero is just V. And of these, which ones would the bat actually be able to hear? Which ones would the bat, which one of these of these frequencies does the bat know? F3. Uh, yeah, you're, you're at, as the bat, you are hearing F3. And also, which sound did the bat create? F1. F1, yeah. So those are known quantities. F2, you don't know. F2 is the sound that hits the moth. And so we don't know what that is, but we don't actually need to know what that is because we can take F2 being equal to this whole thing and just substitute that in. We can take this entire section and substitute it for F2. That gives us a unified equation. We can say F3 equals Instead of F2, we can write this entire box, F1 times V minus Vm over V. Times V over V plus Vm. We deduced it was a plus sign because yes, because F3 is expected to be smaller. The fact that the moth is, the source is flying away from the listener suggests a lower frequency will be heard. And so we ask ourselves for the denominator, if you want the result to be smaller, should the denominator be larger or smaller? A larger denominator will lead to a smaller result. So we use plus to make it a larger denominator. We choose the sign that makes what we want to happen, happen. Any other questions on that so far? How do we know, or how does like the bat know what F3 is? Uh, F3 is the, the echo that the bat hears back. So you, you create this cheap sound and then you listen for the echo to come back. So this would be the sound that you make with your mouth and this would be the sound that you hear back with your ears. Okay. And of course the bat is not thinking of these in terms of numeric frequencies. The bat doesn't have a, uh, 
uh, musical instrument tuner and watching it for exactly what these notes are. Again, this is a learned experience thing that by a combination of instinct and experience out hunting bugs in the real world, you would develop an intuition for, okay, if I make this sound and I hear back this other sound, that means the bug is probably traveling about this fast. And I should change course this much in order to catch up with it. So it is, uh, in practice, it would be an intuition thing from the bat's perspective. But we can model it mathematically to also to, to have another way of seeing what's going on and being very precise about it. And in this equation, when we multiply these together, what's going to happen? Can we simplify anything there? We can cancel out the velocities of the way. Yeah. To begin with, those uh, v in the numerator and v in the denominator cancel out. So we're left with, also we could divide both sides by f1. So f3 over f1 equals v minus speed of the moth over v plus speed of the moth. <clears throat> and then I guess we could just multiply both sides by v plus vm, multiply both sides by f1, and we get f3 times v plus f3 times v moth equals f1 times this. So f1 times v minus f1 times v moth. That at least clears out all the fractions. And at this point, what would be the only unknown here? Vm. Yeah, we don't know the speed of the moth. We can find it by moving all the terms of v moth to one side. So maybe add f1 v moth to both sides. We get f1 v moth plus f3 v moth. We can factor out v moth and then move everything else to the other side. f1 v minus f3 v. So that's f1 minus f3 times v. Then divide both sides by f1 plus f3 and we get a formula for speed of the moth. So based on those frequencies, this gives us a formula for how fast the moth is traveling, specifically as a fraction of the speed of sound. And you could use this to program a uh, electronic sonar thing, ele electronic echolocation device. If you wanted to build an electronic device that mimics the ability of the bat to do this. Any questions on that so far? Out of curiosity, how does the bat know the direction? Is, is there a way to know, or is it going to be the same? Yeah, for instance, the fact that the, we were using the fact that the moth is moving away to deduce what, uh, what results. What did it tell us, the fact that the moth was moving away? Well, moving away will mean that you'll hear a lower pitch. Right. Um, if the moth was moving towards, what would that tell you? You'd hear a higher pitch. Yeah. And that goes in reverse. The bat, of course, doesn't know in advance which direction the moth is moving. But if you send out a sound and you hear back a higher sound, that suggests that the moth is moving towards you. But if the um, moth is like moving, how do you know it's like which direction? Like how do you know to turn left or to right? To, or I guess that's... I think that would be more a more complicated effect based on the fact that you're not just sending out sound in one direction and back. You're sending out sound in all directions. Some of it echoes back, some oh. of it doesn't. I see. And okay. bats have such weird, complicated, curvy looking ears is because that the curvature allows them to get much more information about which direction the sound is coming from. So if you send out a, a high pitched sound and you hear an echo back from right here, and then on the next high pitched sound, you hear an echo back from right here, that tells you the object has moved from here to here. I see, okay, thank you so much. That, mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense and very interesting. Yeah, yeah, this is one of my favorite, favorite applications of the Doppler effect that the, I mean, just based on echoes, the bat can hear where objects are. But due to the Doppler effect, the bat can also hear speed. You can hear how fast the object is going and whether it's moving towards you away or away from you, just based on how the sound changes when it echoes back to you. 
And this is also used uh, technologically in, I think it's called a Doppler ultrasound. The, the standard ultrasounds to detect what's going on inside a person's body uses sound waves that go through flesh and bounce off of harder objects like bone to figure out where things are in the body. But by using a Doppler ultrasound, you send out the sound pulse and it bounces back and you measure not only how long it took to bounce back, which tells you how deep something is, but also it can detect minute changes in pitch, which tells you is that piece of the body moving towards the equipment or away from the equipment. So you can actually get an idea of how things are moving inside the body as well as where things are. Yeah, this is amazing applications of this core concept to being able to see organs moving inside the body. It's a huge jump in technology. So, so much more useful, so much more practical than cutting somebody open to see what's going on inside. The more we can do non-surgically, the better. Uh, any other questions on the Doppler effect stuff? Could I ask another question about um, the sound and like what each thing represents, like amplitude would represent, would that be the, the volume of the sound or? Yeah, in terms of sound, amplitude is about how loud it is. I would say that then, it, loudness is really more about intensity, I think, but intensity is always proportional to amplitude squared, I think. So amplitude and intensity and loudness are all basically the same, same concept. And the frequency would be the, the pitch? Yeah, yeah. So higher frequency means you're hearing a higher pitch note. Would wavelength change anything or? Uh, only in the sense that speed? wavelength and frequency are basically the same concept. Or okay. they're, they're inversely proportional to each other. So a, okay. a lower wavelength means a higher frequency means a higher pitch note. Would, but would speed change anything? changes when you go from one medium to another, whereas frequency doesn't. So I would say frequency is a more reliable predictor of what note you're listening to. Okay, and what about the speed? Would that, like, how would that be perceived? Uh, speed isn't really perceived exactly. Speed just determines how soon, the, how soon after the sound was produced that you hear it. Like if you're talking about okay. a medium that's got a very fast speed of sound, you're gonna hear the sound very soon after it's produced. If you've got a slower speed of sound, it's going to take longer for the sound to reach your ears. But it doesn't. Is that kind of why, like, when a volcano erupts, it takes a while for it to hit you? Or uh, the sound of it? Yeah. 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 If, it, it, I mean, this is, this is true for any sound, really, but it's most noticeable for really big, really loud sounds because those can be heard from a long way away. Uh, lightning strikes are a common example that you, you see the flash of the lightning. And then a few seconds later, you hear the kaboom of the thunder. That's because the, the, light is the light from the lightning is traveling so fast that it reaches your eyes almost instantly. Not completely instantly, but so fast it may as well be instant. But the sound takes longer to reach your ears because sound is traveling much more slowly than light. And so ba based on, if you assume that the light effectively travels instantly, almost instantly, then you can count how much time later the sound reaches you and if you know the speed of sound and how much time it took to reach your location, you can say speed equals distance over time. You know how much time it took, you know the speed of sound in that medium, you can calculate how far it traveled. And that's the other aspect of the ultrasound. You send out the pulse of sound, measure when it, <clears throat> what time it reached your location again, based on speed of sound in the flesh of the body or water or air or whatever and you know how much time it took to go there and back. So you can solve for how far it traveled to do so. Any other questions on that? 